and you are very welcome to the 32nd Galway Film FLA, the virtual version. And this is the In Conversation with Screenwriters event. And we're presenting this in association with Screen Skills Ireland. We're very grateful to them for their support. So my name is Mary Kate O'Flanagan and uh, I'm a screenwriter and a story consultant on scripts. And it's my honour and my delight now to be in conversation with Nicole Holof Center. So uh, every cloud has a silver lining. We've invited Nicole to be our guest in person at the FLA like every year I think for the last four years um, but it's, uh, her busy schedule has never allowed but look we have her as a virtual guest this year so that's a great bonus uh, particularly for me because I'm such a fan of her work so thank you so much Nicole for joining us here today. My pleasure it's I'm really happy to be able to do this without having to fly to Ireland although I'd rather be in Ireland. Well, we will have you like, please God, like the plan is that like if the schedules line up, we'll have you in person next year. So we're if I do a good job today, right? If I, you know, I'm on trial here. If you do a really bad job, then we'll have to get you to get the good job. So don't worry. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so Nicole, I was saying to you, like, you know, I mean, I wanted you to have you as a guest because I'm a great fan of your work. But I was also saying, I think it's particularly valuable. You know, these events are for professionals. And I think as an American filmmaker, you're really interesting to European filmmakers because your work is very personal. And um, I mean, I've heard you compared to Jake, to, to Mike Lee, but um, I have a sister, who Rachel, who also works in this business, and she says she is the cinematic Jane Austen. Um, wow. And I completely agree with that because we were both enthusing about your work and saying how mm -hmm. you take the personal and make it epic. Um, but that's the kind of film that we make much more in Ireland and in Europe than, yeah. you know, in, but talk to me just about like, what is it like forging a career in a market that wants high concept and high octane movies? How have you found that? Um, well, I never felt like I could make one of those movies and do it well and have a good time. You know, um, I, I mean, I feel like I could make one of them, but that's not what I'm in it for. Um, and luckily, I, you know, I, I came up in the 90s and I think it was really a perfect time for female independent filmmakers to make smaller movies. And um, I've been able to continue that um, somehow. I guess because my movies haven't lost money and some of them have actually made money. So... I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing. And I, you know, I do get offered sometimes much bigger movies, but um, I don't, I don't want to do those as tempting as the money is um, or the, you know, the huge audience. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, luck, luck has shined on me. Okay. So like another way of saying it is you've just plowed your own furrow, regardless of the temptations or what the market has. Yeah. Offered or told you that you should be or could be like, yeah. that's like you're making smaller films but they do make their money back so great so you get to make the next one mm -hmm. um you do work with massive stars um you know so people like Frances McDormand Jennifer Anderson Catherine Keener like yeah. Uh, how, like, I I feel like maybe it's just me, but maybe I'm, <laughs> I shouldn't speak for my whole country, but like, I have a cultural inferiority complex that makes me think, well, I only have a very small film. So like, you know, a great actor who's obviously been offering, being offered loads and loads of stuff, wouldn't consider it, but you don't, you forge these relationships, regardless of the fact that that's not going to be the best offer that, you know, Jennifer Aniston is going to get this year in terms of money or indeed audience. So, right. so how do you appeal to someone like that? Um, well, you know, on my first film, I, I, I couldn't get huge stars. I got up and coming stars and that was really important. You know, um, they wouldn't let me hire just anybody. And, um, and so, um, but I was happy with my cast. And then um, I think that a lot of uh, movie stars want smaller, more um, interesting roles and, um, want to challenge themselves and so luckily I've kind of become someone they want to work with and so I've been told you know by a lot of actors I want to work with you or I'll have meetings with actors that I'm surprised I mean it's not I don't I hope I don't sound you know like false humility but 
I'm always shocked. Like, you know, my work, like I'm an equal fan to Fran McDormand. You know what I mean? It's just, it's thrilling. So, um, you know, a lot of them pass and um, they know, and the ones who are in, you know, they're not going to get any money, um, but we'll have a good time. And I think the, you know, the more movies I make, the more people will see them and more actors want to be in them. Um, well, and then you have a film like Can You Ever Forgive Me that goes to the Oscars, right? Like, you know, just right. because you've been true to yourself and the kind of thing that's interesting to right. you. Right. Like, that must be gratifying to say the least. It was very gratifying. Um, you know, I adapted it from a memoir. Mm -hmm. um, so it didn't come from up here. Um, you know, I mean, I made up a lot of stuff, but it was it was thrilling um, and frightening. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I personally think sometimes adaptation is harder than something that comes from up here because you are, you know, you, you've got to be truthful to what somebody else was trying to express. Um, but we're going to look at some clips from some of your movies. So uh, we're going to talk, start with Friends With Money, not your first movie, but the first one chronologically. We, we don't have that much time, so we're going to look at three today. So we're going to start with the first clip, which is the introductions of the main characters. It's literally the opening of um, the film. And I just want to talk afterwards to you about your process of both hooking the audience in, but also economically communicating these characters and the dynamics between them. Um, so if we're ready, we have David here's tech support. David, will you play us the first clip from Friends With Money, please? Hey, so, uh, we're back. Um, so, Nicole, this is just like one of my all time favorites. Like, I think it's up there with uh, the opening of Deliverance um, in terms of introductions of characters. You know, um, the big chill is the other one that I always think of, like everyone's packing and you're getting all this information about them um, from what they pack and how they pack. Will you just talk about what you were thinking about and how did you come up with the conceit of the rather transgressive thing that Jennifer's character does? Oh, you know, first of all, I remember nothing. I'm just going to say that right out of the gate. I mean, some things I remember, but it's going to be disappointing. Um, and, you know, I seem to start many of my scripts this way in a kind of ensemble introduction. Um, I'm trying to think how, I don't remember how I came up with Jennifer and the vibrator. I swear that's not me. Yes, it's a <laughs> personal film, but I've never done that. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't remember. It's just so funny when, you know, maids have access to such personal stuff, um, that, uh, that's probably where it came from is how weird that is. Um, and that we don't know what they're going through, like my diary or, you know, whatever. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I'm watching it now, you know, it is pretty, concise like each thing does eventually kind of pay off which is really cool um and I didn't you know I don't know if I knew that as I was writing it in the beginning usually it, I realized later oh that that's gonna pay off or mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm paying this off without realizing it you know like Catherine Keener stepping on um the toy on the floor yes. you know yeah. in the opening thing and that nobody notices you know um and um because that does pay off later um but also that she's distracted at the moment that jason isaac says oh never mind the neighbor you know right. so she hasn't fully participated in that decision which is really right right yeah. and also he cuts her off you know it's very subtle but he cuts her off um this you know a perfectly happy marriage you can cut someone up, but also this is just, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing and, um, and with Francis McDormand and, and, um, Simon McBurney, you know, he, I wanted him to seem, you know, vain and maybe gay and, um, uh, and she's depressed. And so there you go. You know, it's, it's all there. I hope. It is all there. I actually showed it to a group of uh, writers that I'm working with at the moment. Um, I, oh. showed, I showed them this clip last night and mm -hmm. you know, as a perfect example. And then I said to them, what do you know? And we went through each scene and said, oh. what do you know? And like, it was so interesting that everybody could say. And in fact, just like you were saying, like Jason Isaac cuts her off. She doesn't notice, but we do. But when Frances McDormand says, 
you're pathetic. That actually is an indication of intimacy and affection. Yeah. It seems like you know because she's not saying it to someone else behind his back you know right. um and he doesn't take offense but yeah the way it lingers on her she looks so weary you know mm -hmm. yeah. weary, you know um, um that's pretty accurate yeah you can tell someone they're pathetic in a loving way and get away with it you know yeah I would think it is a sign that like these people are on good terms that they can do it but the other relationship is much more worrying you know yeah. that you're like oh, what's this you know um so yeah so would you do you don't well you don't remember like it's not that you would necessarily have come back and rewritten those scenes going actually now I know where they're going would you have known more or less where the stories were going what's your process do you outline the stories or do you just start with the characters and then see where they take you the the latter I don't outline I will take notes um mm -hmm. for a while until it gets frustrating and I really just want to start writing mm -hmm. but I'll you know that is one of the only movies that I had a title for which really before I started writing which really led me to start you know writing mm -hmm. it and knowing generally what it's going to be about at least one of the themes was going to be about that so um I take notes and maybe dip, write down a, the different characters and then just start writing and it's I find it much more fun that way but it's also um can become a big mess around page 60 and I wish then boy do I wish I had outlined this because I don't know where the hell I'm going you know and that's that's been a struggle. Um, but everyone has their own process. So, like, if you find outline yeah. frustrating, you can't outline, right? Right. And if I outlined, I think I'd get bored. I, I've tried to outline, and then within three pages, I'm already off the outline. Like, it doesn't even relate anymore. I'm writing something else. You okay. Know? But this is interesting that you knew with this title, you knew what you were writing about. I mean, my guess is you did with as well with the next film. We'll look at enough said, but. Yeah. Friends with money, like it's so interesting. You and I had a bit of a conversation about late stage capitalism the other day, right? You know, but one of the things that's really interesting to me in this movie is exactly that, that it has this Jane Austen-esque quality, this Jane, that it seems to be about this, you know, small group of people and who they are to each other and how marriages and your marriage status is affecting where you are and all, all of those things. It's a soap opera, right? It's a soap opera, <laughs> basically. Well, for me, it's, it's much bigger than that because I suppose the thing that, you know, it comes down to for me is that, like that great title, that a gulf can open up much more in America, I think, than in Europe between people who are financially successful and people who are not. Mm. But this seems to address or question, you know, the American dream, which like has this to, you know, which is anyone can make it, you know, you, you can make it, anyone can make it in America. But the underside of that is that you're somehow uh, morally culpable if you haven't made it, you know, um, and I just but you know then there is such a thing as like I have a I have a lovely friend in America who goes to a 12-step program called Under Earn is Anonymous and her sponsor was like you're white you're college educated like you know and you are not making money like you know you are always in debt you're doing that to yourself right <laughs> as she, as that's she that's the anonymous one that's like the AA they don't talk to you like that in AA <laughs> Well, I just know like this was what, no, I'm getting this third hand, right? You know, but like, that's what she heard, you know, that it was like, there's something wrong with you. But look, there's a, you have this great scene that's from the middle of the film. This is in the hospital waiting room. So Frances McDormand in her character in her depression has walked into a plate glass window. So everybody got the call and it's just a great way of putting everybody together. So we'll have, so everyone except for the Frances McDormand character is in the hospital waiting room and tensions are, emotions are high anyway, but this subject of, you know, whether you're culpable for not, for not having a great career in your 30s. <laughs> and white, and you look like Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. Very dare you. So David, if you're okay, we'll play hospital waiting room.
Yeah, so one of the things that I really love about your work is it feels like, even though this is like very glamorous LA, it feels like my life. It feels like my people, you know, that like even in a crisis, somebody be looking at someone else going, I don't even gay. You know, <laughs> that there's all these sidebar things going on. You know, the actors are so good. I watched this. I haven't seen it in a long time. It's like, you guys, thank you. Thank you. So but this goes back to like why you get actors of that caliber because they can tell they, they're really going to be able to get their teeth into that I guess so yeah I mean there's some funny subtle stuff and um yeah I, I guess it's hard for me to talk about that but um yeah I guess they want to play good scenes I think that's a pretty good scene and one of the things that I notice is that you never come down on one side or another um on a lot of subjects you know so you know both people get to have their say there and I don't think you you know yeah. I don't think you fully agree with either Jennifer Aniston or Joan Cusack like you know I, I neither of them is the villain neither of them's right neither of them's wrong does that make right sense? right although I do get to express both my opinions because I do feel like why the hell are you throwing a benefit just you know forget it just give them the money and yet that's what they do. And it's not, you know, Joan Cusack's fault that they do it. Um, and she feels, I think, I think she feels even a little bit ashamed that that's how they do it. And that's why she's yelling at her, you know? It's like, it's not my fault. This is just how it's done. And I've invited you, so shut up, you know? Um, yeah, I love, I love those characters. I love them all. Um, yeah, I think, I guess a lot of the time I don't, I don't choose bad guys. Um, although I think, you know, Keener constantly saying he's gay is not the, you know, the most polite thing in the world. Um, but I get it. No, but polite isn't necessarily, you know, what you, you know, for A, a quality you want in a character or B, a quality you want in a friend, you know? Right. Um, but, you know, but, but that's another issue that I feel like when I watch that film, I don't know by the end of it uh like is he or not like or does mm -hmm. he know like is he but does he not know um i mean yeah. look, this well, needs, it, it, go on sorry it's it's actually based on someone and um and i'm free to say he does not know or i don't know um i did send him all the clothes that Simon McBurney wears in the movie. <laughs> and um, I think he was grateful. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't really care whether he was or he wasn't. It was really about the fact that he's a love, really lovely person and a loving husband. And maybe he is just Aaron, you know? That's just, you can't label everybody. Well, that's what I thought was so great. Like, you know, that this mystery is kind of set up as you, as we saw in the very, very beginning scene that you're going, yeah. oh, and then, you know, some, one of the couples, you know, they, they even speculate about their love life, you know, they know things about each other's love lives, you know, um, that felt very familiar to me, absolutely shocking to like, you know, our parents' generation, you know, but that like, we're much more open about telling each other things like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but um, it segues nicely into the next scene from, and it's the last scene that we have um, from Friends With Money. But I would just like, really like to look at, um, what I really love about this is the scenes of aftermath. So we're gonna see, so what's happened is like, so Simon Burney's character's friend, Aaron, has met this man that he's connected with and they are both lonely. They would both like a friend. I'm just saying this for the audience, not for you, um, for our audience. So they've um, befriended each other and the most natural thing to do is to, you know, bring their wives into that friendship. So this is a awkward brunch, David, that we're going to play now. Um, but what I really love about it is that we have, the face that you put on when you're in company and then the face that like you who you really are when you're alone with your partner that you trust right and that's right, right. so let's play that clip thank you yeah it's really hard for me to just watch a clip <laughs> from these films because i always want to just keep going keep going it went farther than i thought it was gonna go uh, like 
see in that car scene is the process trailer pulling the car and how bound it's like boom 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 sorry <laughs> oh really i don't notice stuff like that oh, you will. <laughs> like once i'm engaged you know i just i don't notice anything like that the boom could be in shot everything and i'm just okay, like good. what's she gonna say next right. so, um so was there like one of the things like i say i love that thing of and you know what happens when the mask falls away mm -hmm. um yeah. And we get to see that in both of those, in both of those scenes. But the uh -oh. other thing, are you okay? Yeah, did that block the, my son is calling me and somehow it just, it, I turned everything off. So I don't know, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Do you need to answer? Do I don't know. Answer <laughs> okay, all right. If he calls again, we can stop and resume in a minute. I don't know. Um, but the other thing about this is that, you know, it's very hard to dramatize depression. Yeah. So uh, I'm interested just in how you came up with the specificity of her stopping washing her hair. Again, was that borrowed from someone else's life or? No, you know? me, that was me. Um, I don't even know if I, I, I guess when I felt that way, I think, boy, I must be really depressed if like, you know, my arms get tired when I wash my hair and you do just have to do it again. It is that kind of, you know, gerbil wheel that mm -hmm. one feels when one is depressed, or at least I do. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that, and it's not even like I've run around looking, you know, with greaseball hair or anything. It's just something that I was aware of. And um, yeah, um, midlife, midlife exhaustion and depression and um yeah and i've certainly had those things i do suffer from depression sometimes and anxiety and you know mm -hmm. so i get to put all my crap onto you know characters and make it more entertaining than it is in real life the other thing that i love about this and about friends with money is that like clearly jennifer aniston character is still struggling to find her place in the world and she's struggling to earn her living um you know which is humiliating you know and there's the really 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 great scene when her date helps her yeah wants yeah. Half money. i mean i still have resentment against that character <laughs> whenever i think about him he's sort of he's sort of an amalgamation of all the shitty boyfriends i had who you know took advantage of me or treated me badly when i left them you know like this never actually happened to me you mm -hmm. know with my money but i thought this is a crappy thing to do this is sort of putting them all together. But you're almost more yeah. cross. If people haven't watched the movie recently, they can go back and watch it. You're yeah. almost more cross with her. I am almost more cross with her. Right. For Absolutely. Thing to his completely unreasonable request, you know? Yeah, I know. And in retrospect, watching the movie, I sometimes feel like, no, she, she should have not done that or had more of a conflict about it, but she's such a victim. Um, Oh, I just find yeah. it's like, it's so audacious what he asks her, yeah. that she's just so taken aback. And I still think of times when I, you know, the, the resentments I still, you know, can wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, it's very often because I was so taken aback with what somebody asked of me yeah. that I went, oh, okay. And I feel like that's what she's doing. So it feels very truthful to me. But I'm still cross with her for not going. How very dare you? Because I'm cross with my for not saying absolutely not. No, I just wonder if some things um, get too broad and they pop out. Um, but I think uh, I don't know. Well, I mean that whole scene is like it's it's awkward and yeah. You know, but on the other side of that, this is what I love about this film is we can all feel like when we're at, you know, and certainly, you know, like a lot of creative people, I had like the career in my twenties where I was making, you know, good money and da, 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 but I couldn't bear it because I just couldn't go to a, an office anymore five days a week, you know? So I chose a more uncertain path, but you can often feel at that stage, oh, if only I had, you know, the recognition and the income and the da, 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 then I would be happy. Yeah. But that's what the Frances McDormand character has. Right. She's the most successful, you understand, and her clothes are exquisite. And you know, like, but you understand she's never gonna have money worries again in her life. And well, more the other couple, more um Joan Cusack and Greg German. They okay. they have the big money. But um, 
but it is just that she's expressing herself creatively and she's successful and recognized and she dresses them all but it's that moment of going that wasn't it like that I love that line she's like I'm I'm waiting for my fabulous life to start you know when unspoken is apparently I'm in the middle of it but I'm not feeling we all you know I'm in the middle of my fabulous life and I don't run around going I have a fabulous life Uh (laughs) uh-huh like it's something kind of interesting isn't it but I mean it is that thing like I I read Annie Lamotte on that subject recently that she was you know saying you think like to younger writers and you know she's a novelist so she talks about getting published rather than produced but it's the same thing she's like you think getting published will change your life it won't (laughs) you know and I guess you've had that experience right yeah I mean but it makes for really exciting and gratifying moments in my life you know thrilling wonderful things to know to feel like I I am doing exactly what I want to be doing and I don't always do it right and I'm very hard on myself but um yeah that is I have to say that it ain't nothing I don't run around saying look at my fabulous life but I feel very very lucky that I've reached a goal and have been able to express myself in a way that I've wanted to so I I'm very grateful for that And you're really in demand in television as a television director, as well as making your own stuff? Um, Yeah, I have been. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if it's falling off or not. There's just so many shows and so many new directors and now so many women directors. Mm -hmm. Let them have it. You know, let them have it. Um, If a show comes up that I really love, I will ask if I could direct one. Um, Okay, and you're in a position that that's like a, that's an etiquette thing that's okay to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my agent would call up and say, Nicole's a fan of the show. Do you have any openings? And Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done that in a really long time. Um, When was the last time you did it? Do you remember? um, Well, I know that I wanted to direct an episode of High Maintenance. Do you know Mm -hmm. that show? I don't. Oh, it's great. HBO show. And, um, and so we, we found out that they would love to have me. I went and had a meeting and then I was unavailable. Like, I don't remember what happened, but I couldn't do it, but that, that would have been a good, a good match. Yeah. Oh, well, now I'm going to go and look for, look at it. Cause if it's your cup of tea, then I'm I bet I would love very it. similar to my kind of slice of life and human behavior stuff. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to like enough said. Um, so uh, I always laugh um, and I, I did have this conversation with you where I was going this is one of my favorite all-time favorite movies and I always struggle to remember the title um, bad but, title no wonder it's like just a couple of words yeah and I, I but but I did tell you and let me just say because I've said the thing about the title my response to this was I saw this um, and just because Ireland's small it doesn't sustain a lot of art house cinemas so you know the kind of film like yours that gets an art house cinema release gets a short one like maybe two weeks and I saw this and I knew that not a lot of people had so as soon as it became available I think it was on DVD um I hired a screening room and I asked everyone that I love because I went you have to see this film this was my really Um, I did I 100% did I was like everyone that I love has to see this film with me ideally we'll all hold hands at the same time because at the same time no I said if if we could I would have held everybody in the room's hand at the same time as well um but everybody loved it and actually one of the moments and it's one of the clips we're going to see well actually let's just watch the first clip from um enough said I'm just reminding myself if I need to cue it up somehow oh yeah so well I mean you can tell the audience like what is enough said about we're gonna we're gonna go watch first date so whatever you think the audience listening to us needs to know um, the we- first date in his house no the second date is in his house the first date is them going to dinner and he says, oh, I promise you I booked a oh. table. They're queuing. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, they met at a party. And um, I mean, there's not much to set up because it is the beginning of the movie. They met at a party. and um, The thing they bonded over is that both of them have a daughter who's about to leave for college. Right. Thank and you. that's the, the a, a third party, you know, says, um, oh, but it's normal. Like your children are meant to grow up and leave you. Right. 
and he says shut up and she's like yeah shut up or the other way around you know so they bond agree that it's like the end of their lives as as they know it because their daughters are leaving and they're big Mm -hmm. songs yeah. And they're both single parents. So he he then gets her number and he takes her on a date. So David, if it's okay, we'll play that first date clip. Okay, so again, I apologize. The clips are long because I find it really, really hard to cut them off. I wanted to watch the next bit and write to when they part and everything. Hey, um, it's interesting to me. It's fun to watch from after a long time. That was a good yeah. date, right? They had a good date. It's such a good date. And I mean, again, like, you know, these amazing actors that you have, but like from the moment where she's like, do you like fake boobs? And he says, I like real boobs. And she says, I have real boobs. And then she's like. (laughs) When we shot, when we shot that scene, I think it was, we were joking about the real boobs and, and Jim was like, I like, I like any kind of boobs. I like fake boobs. I like real boobs. I'm like, well, you don't like fake boobs in this scene. (laughs) Pretend you're someone else. So this was like the last film that he made before he, he passed. made one other movie after this called yeah. The Drop. Um, okay. Was- Which was not my cup of tea. Um, so like I wasn't sure like when they got released when he would have filmed them. But uh, you know the one of the scenes that we'll watch in a minute. Um, when I was watching it, I got such tears in my eyes because he'd passed by the time it was released. And I got tears in my eyes for the character and he's just doing such an amazing job. But I also thought, I'm so glad this was your swan song. I'm so glad you got to play this part so brilliantly. It was just a lovely thing. And again, it goes back to how you, and I hope that would be inspiring for Irish filmmakers, you know, like if you write a good enough stuff, you can get the person that everybody wants, right? You know, because they go, yeah, I want to do this. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't believe he was a fan of my films, you know, beforehand. And that, um, you know, I think he was very scared of taking on this part, but... um, Oh, really? Yeah, I think he wanted to because he wanted to stretch himself or, you know, do something different Mm -hmm. um, and play a leading man. Um, But, uh, you know, he did it beautifully. He did it really beautifully. And um, there is, I'm always interested, I'm just curious about stuff like this they're both vulnerable which is really what the film is about you know in fact it's kind of been foreshadowed in that scene and I don't want to spoil it for people who may not have seen it yet but I guess mm, it's gonna no we won't go into all of it because the clips that I've chosen won't you know give all of the game away um but uh it's very foreshadowed everything in there is foreshadowing stuff it's weird but you don't realize that till you watch it the second time it feels very subtle because it feels like a natural thing that people would say, you know, right. like, why did your marriage end or like, and then because you use a lot of humor there, you know, it's like, oh, we should just wear signs saying slobby or hair, you know, like it's great, <laughs> fun, you know, all of that. And, yeah. and all of this stuff about the containers and the guacamole and all of that stuff, like when you watch it again and it would have, have come out like that the first time you wrote it. Um. I don't remember, but I don't think I went back and stuck more stuff in there. I think since I knew what the movie was going to be about in terms of its plot, um, you know, that I loaded it up with with those things um, in the beginning. I mean, I always go back and rewrite everything, but I don't know if I went back specifically to, you know, create foreshadowing. Um, I kind of followed it. With the, so, yeah, yeah, so with this, like you say, that's a great date, right? Like that's a great first date. Yeah. Like, how did you write a great first date? Did you ask your friends? Did you just go, "This is the date I'd like to go on," or was it I like guess, a date you'd been on? Um, I guess it was the way maybe I've talked to with boyfriends when there's been a really good date, how we connect and what we connect on. Um, you know, um it just seemed fun. And I could really, um, I guess, put myself in the character's shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, But something like the guacamole, you know, which end up ends up paying off later. I didn't know I was going to pay that off later. I knew that, you know, a friend of mine had told me about this and how the, you know, the wife couldn't bear the scraping of the bull and everything. And I just, that was an example. I didn't know it would play such a big part later. That's the fun of not outlining. It's like later, it's like, oh, I could put that in there, you know? 
Oh, how nice. Um, but there's a big thing about like that they are and they're talking about that in in a jokey kind of way that like right. you'd like to know in advance what you're getting. But one of his vulnerabilities in the final film is he's anxious about his weight. He says, yeah. when I'm on top of you, please tell me the truth. Like when I'm on top of you, can you breathe? Did you write that or did you change it because he was a big man or like Mm, do you remember I probably wrote it for him mm -hmm. because she also in an earlier scene says he's kind of fat yeah uh, to a friend um so definitely wrote it for Jim um okay. he knows what he looks like unfortunately mm -hmm. he you know he hated his weight and was very self-conscious but was willing to do that um uh so yeah I I rewrite definitely for certain characters like in lovely and amazing you know Emily Mortimer stands there, you know, naked, right? And he's gonna tell her what was wrong with her. And originally I'd written the scene for somebody with a less perfect body, you know? It's like, oh shit, I want Emily Mortimer, but look at her, she's perfect, you know? So he's got, he's talking about how she's too skinny or, you know, okay. really finding very small things, you know? So I had to rewrite that for her. Uh -huh. so, yeah. We don't have this clip, but I absolutely love it. And now that I have you here, I'm gonna ask you, um, it's this moment of great intimacy when she wants to look inside his mouth. Oh yeah. And like going, and it's the aftermath of sex, I guess. They're in bed with the yeah. sheet coiled around them. Um, but he's letting her look inside and she's like, oh, you've got a missing tooth. And he goes, yeah, I know, I know. Like, he's like, I always mean to get it replaced, but it's expensive and painful. And, and she's like, well, it's all the way at the back, you know, and all of that. <laughs> How did you come up with that? It was so interesting to me. And again, to yeah. me, when I see something that's so specific like that, these people feel like real people as opposed to seeing something that I've seen in five other movies. Right, right. That's you know, like good. I never again want to see a couple at a fun fair where she's got right. a cuddly toy, unless it's a spook. Right. You know, right? Right, right. Like, that's you know, true. but like, so how did you, do you remember how you came up with that? Um, I know that my boyfriend was missing a tooth um, and I probably got it from that. It was way in the back and he was mm -hmm. self-conscious and he got it replaced and all that. But I do know I wanted it to be about older people, very much about older people. And so, you know, um, yeah, he was missing a tooth because he's, you know, getting there old and we have root canals and, you know, all these hideous things. The thing is I, I, I'm glad I'm glad that's in there and I think it's terrific and everything. But some people will watch that and be grossed out. And that's probably why I'm not rich <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's like not romantic or um, yeah, there's people out there who, you know, obviously my movies are not everyone's cup of tea, but that's the kind of thing I think that um, reaches a certain kind of person and not another. Oh, that's so interesting. But I mean, I suppose there's nobody who's made a film that everybody likes, right? That it just right. doesn't exist. And those people are stupid what the people the who don't like, like movies? you know if, if they don't, if they think that's icky it's like well they're stupid that's what i can tell oh well, the, 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 yeah, to me it's just a, it's about the intimacy and if she was repulsed it would be a completely different scene right. but she's like show me show me show me and then because she goes yeah. oh it's all the way in the back so it's like it's like it's okay for him to show her but i'm jumping forward in the chronology so we're going to look at the scene of the second date so they have this great first date she declines to kiss him, um, but she does say she likes him and maybe. So now they're having second date, which is brunch at his house. And just again, what I really love about this and the reason I wanted to include it is when you're embarking on a new relationship, whatever age you are, you can but be like, is there something wrong with this person? I need to find out if there's something wrong with this person. And I think there's a little, and yeah, there's just a little bit of that done in this really lovely way where you completely fall in love with him anyway I think you're already in love with her but anyway let's just let's just watch the scene so she's turning up for brunch at his house for the first time so we'll play that David thanks so this is like the great second date you know um, <laughs> but again I just love like the specificity of it like was that just plucked from the tree of your imagination yes it was <laughs> Okay, no. yeah I mean I don't know how I yeah I just wrote it I don't know how to explain 
writers, you don't know how to explain why, how you wrote something, right? No, but I think the thing that's important is his save, right? So like what I love is like her kind of like, did I get the day wrong? Like, why is he not dressed, you know? And she's sort of looking at his apartment like, I'm not sure if I do like it or his home. I'm not sure if I do like it. And there's the, again, you know, I notice when I rewatch these films, how everything is knitted so tightly. Like, you know, we're building towards the event of her putting her daughter on a plane, which is like one of my favorite, you know, scenes in the movies. Um, but let me ask you actually about this. Like you came up with this subplot that this is the thing that they have in common, that both their daughters are leaving for college. Yeah. You cast an Irish actor as his daughter. I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, she did a pretty good American accent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how can you not cast her? You know, she was just perfect for the part. Um, great. And we we'll see her in a minute, like when we look at the next clip. Yeah. Okay, good. But yeah. that, that theme then becomes really important in the film. Her relationship with her daughter gets a lot of airtime. Mm -hmm. Did you know that was going to happen? Or was it just that you felt like, if it's about two people that don't have anything else going on, like let's say it was a year later and both, both their daughters had left for college, did you think there would be not enough material if it was uh, about the, the relationship or? Yeah, that's a funny thought. Um, I guess it would be about something else, um, but this was so specifically about that point in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and my kids hadn't even left for college yet, um, but I guess, I thought about it a lot. I was dreading it, really dreading it. I have twins and they were gonna go at once and I do knit, but that wasn't gonna carry me through. <laughs> wasn't gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, funny now with coronavirus, of course they're living with me and you know, nothing changes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just wanted it to be about that period of time. Um, yeah, well, it's a, I mean, it does, it gives this enormous depth to the film that it wouldn't otherwise have. And like I say, like, you know, the the airport scene, like with her ex-husband and he says, we made a fine person and she's just entirely undone, yeah. um, you know, and it's great because there's, you know, there's a richness to that whole, you know, she's looking at her ex-husband and she says to him, do you remember why we got married? And, you know, there's a time when she's the wedding album open and she's like, I'm trying to remember, like, what was it I saw in him and all that, but it's just, there's a, because I think you're a very thoughtful writer, there's a richness to these characters that have relatively little screen time. Mm -hmm. And then that relationship feels so real and that scene I find very moving, even though it's not part of the main plot. Um, right. I'm just aware of the time that we should kick on. So let's just watch um, this scene. So um, my sister, compared what she does this is you know when she was saying it's like Jane Austen too it's like Emma um the picnic at Box Hill um in Jane Austen's Emma what she mm -hmm. does you know that it's like this she hasn't murdered somebody but it's really transgressive and she, okay I don't know what clip you're showing so that sounds interesting don't? well it's the aftermath <clears throat> of that so it's when oh, oh right apologize to him so we're gonna see Eve Hewson so the the actor the Irish actor we're gonna see it in that so do you want to roll it there David thank you thank you I don't know if you can see the collab crying again um all over again <laughs> I love it it's the most gratifying thing to see <laughs> Be weeping at my I always say to people like you know if they if somebody says to me like they heard one of my stories and they cried I always say well my work here is done <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> but again yeah. just like you know talk could would you talk to me about that scene because like we're always warned in film school etc you know don't be on the nose don't have characters say what they really mean you know or what they really think but in that scene they do they really do. I think they earned it. You know, I think by the time we get there, we know them and hopefully love them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that, I think it was really good that neither character really let themselves cry, that they both held it back, you know, because then it would be like corny and soapy, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but that they're trying to hide their feelings in a way or contain themselves, especially him, makes it 
work better. But that's a directing thing, not a writing thing. But writing wise, um, yeah, I just feel like at some point you just got to say it, tell it like it is. You know, she's so contrite and humiliated and so is he. That's um, the thing. And I think like, well, also she does, she, he demands honesty from her when he says she needed massages, you know, he calls yeah. her out and that's why, you know, the Emma reference, you know, uh, I think is so perfect. You know, when I Mr. don't remember that scene in Emma, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Well, yeah, no, it may not be a great reference. Um, but Mr. Knightley says to Emma, badly done, Emma, badly done indeed. And mm -hmm. she, just like that she's entirely contrite you know and she knows she did wrong and she's been called out by the person whose good opinion she cares about the most right. you know, is saying to her you you did wrong in a moment of giddiness I mean it's a different motivation in Emma but it's the same kind of thing that if you really care about those characters it lands on you in a really profound way um, well, she needs to be you know she needs to be punished a bit you know she needs to be called out for her bad behavior. And the truth is as well that well, to me, and, you know, I literally found this life changing, you know, um, because she says, I was trying to protect myself. Yeah. And he says, but what about us? And she goes, mm, mm, I didn't protect us. And like, that's what was life changing for me because I, you know, I was starting a relationship kind of in the middle age myself. And it was like, oh, that's the shift you have to make if you want this to last. Right, right. You don't protect yourself. You protect the relationship. And like, that's just like the profound. And like, I still, I mean, obviously there's two of us in it and there's lots of other things, but like, that's a profound that was a profound shift in perspective for me, you know, but I also found like that thing of like, yeah, at the beginning when she's kind of going to Tony Collette, Tony Collette says, oh, you might as well go on a date, you have nothing to lose. And she goes, no, but he does, which is a reference to his weight, right? Um, but by the end, she's just like, here is this imperfect package, but in that scene, like here's this person and I'm gonna lose him because I didn't value him enough. Like it's such a beautiful, beautiful love story. You know, I, I love her so much. And that's the scene where I was like, I'm so glad he got to play this part and all of that. And I notice only now watching it. Oh, I meant to say to you about the writing though, like when you're saying the thing of them not crying, actually, like I always say, when I'm, you know, that I was taught there's only two hard rules in screenwriting, but I always say, you know, the third is um, if the characters feel sorry for themselves, the audience won't. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, don't let the characters cry, don't let the characters cry, don't let the characters, you know, like until one moment, maybe one, you know, like, but like self pity is really on screen, like, it's, I think it's really corrosive. So it's interesting that you would say that's kind of a directing thing, but I would go, well, be careful writers as well. Um, but what I noticed actually, and I never noticed it before is that he says, what's worse is you made me look foolish in front of my daughter. But then she starts to make reparation in at least that one way. Mm -hmm. When Tess says, he just really, really liked you. Mm -hmm. And she says, I just really, really liked him. And she's taking full responsibility for mm -hmm. that. She has actually restored that bit of dignity to him. Mm -hmm. The thing that he said was the worst. So I hadn't even noticed, like, but that's a great out of that scene, you know, like, uh, yeah. Well, also, you know, she had nothing really good to say about her, the daughter, you know, and now she, I think she feels like she was so cold and judgmental throughout, you know, and here's this girl, she's just this young girl, you know, wants her dad to be happy. So. Well, that's right, yeah, because like, you know, that's a really interesting part because when she first meets her, you know, she's a bit taken aback, you know, when she tells her own daughter, she's yeah. kind of awful, I think is the word she says. She says she's a terrible snob, but yeah, in that moment, everyone is themselves, everyone's vulnerable. Right. You know, the mask, again, the masks have come off entirely, you know. Um, so, yes, if you haven't, I'm just saying this for the audience, if you haven't seen Enough Said, go and watch Enough Said. <laughs> um, so the last film that we'll talk about, and we should just move on, we've got two clips from Can You Ever Forgive Me? So while David's lining it up, do you want to just talk a little bit about how you got attached to the material? Did you find it and bring it to someone or did someone find you? Yeah. 
Um, uh, producer Ann Carey um, had optioned the memoir of Lee Israels and had hired um, Jeff Whitty, uh, a screenwriter, playwright mostly, but a screenwriter to write the first draft. And he kind of felt stuck and couldn't continue, like didn't know how to improve it anymore. And so she sent it to me and I rewrote it. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, very still, with very much close, still very close to the memoir, but I made up a bunch of stuff as well. Sometimes I don't remember what I made up and what was in the book. I'd have to go read it. Um, but um, so that's how it happened. Um, and so I wrote the screenplay and then, um, and then, um, oh God, yeah. And then Mariel Heller, middle age, older than middle age brain, um, directed it beautifully, I think. Um, really gorgeously. Um, but like, this is like, a, it's a really interesting, um, what's the word uh, challenge for a screenwriter? Because unlike somebody like Julia Louis-Dreyfus, I mean, obviously you've got this amazing actor, Melissa McCarthy, but um, she's not a likable character. Uh, right. She's really an abrasive character, um, but you still just completely fall in love with her. So let's just watch this first clip, David. Um, so this is right near the beginning of the film. You're gonna see, I'm just saying this for the audience, like the opening credits are still bleeding over it, right? Um, but we do know that Lee is in a bad way uh, that she's broke. She has tried to sell some first editions and got into a fight with the guy she was trying to sell them to. So we've seen that she's not so charming either, but let's just have a look at this clip. She's going to a party at her agent's house. Okay, so like, yeah, there you see, like it's almost, it's right near the beginning um, of the movie, but um, there's no effort made uh, to make Lee sweet. You know, um, that thing of like when her agent is like, is this why you came? She's like, yes. Um, and this comes up again and again um, during the film that she just doesn't have it in her to be conciliatory or charming you know uh so that's the challenge isn't it and i mean i always you know think like difficult people deserve to have their stories told too perhaps even more so you know right. but how do you respond to that challenge well i think if you're talented and have a very strong personality and are interesting to watch you don't have to be so likable um, you know, if she was unlikable and a real bore, I think, you know, why do it? Um, but, you know, she's a tragic figure and Lee herself and, you know, she, Lee herself and in her memoir makes no apologies for who she is. And she does think she's the smartest person in the room. And um, that might not, you know, make for a lovely gal, but it certainly um, was interesting to me and I never felt the, any interest, and I don't think Marielle did it either, to um, make her lovely or, you know, um, she's tragic. I mean, you know, she steals the coat and she can't believe she got away with it. Um, you know, anybody who throws toilet paper, you know, in their purse, you know, she's desperate. Um, I did add that bit to the script because I did, I was at a fancy party once and I looked, I was just sitting on the toilet and I was like looking, you know, in the cabinet. It was like, there were all these like almost used toilet paper rolls and I just couldn't get my head around it. And I think I asked, not the person who's the host was, but someone else, like, why would they do that? And she explained it to me and I thought, that's, that's good, I'm glad it's in there. Um, that's great yeah I mean the thing that I always love about anybody is and I, I agree with you like you know if she was you know abrasive and boring like that would be unforgivable but she's not but what I always think is like what I'm interested in is somebody who is trying to change her own destiny somebody right. who refuses to be a victim so she's gone to the party because she wants her agent to return her calls and that's and like she believes in herself you know she really believes in what she's writing and and that's admirable it's right. great and then and th and that's why I think I'm like actually rubbing my hands licking my chops when she's stolen the coat whereas you know 
if I if it was a real person and I was like I think she took someone else's coat I'd be horrified but when it's in the context of a film and I'm watching somebody who like she doesn't get what she wants out of that interaction but she gets something <laughs> I'm like oh it's the refusal to be a victim do you know and that's mm-hmm. why I just love the work that she did with like you know the fact that she is that you don't remember if it's in the memoir that she stole a coat from that party or was that you you no, know, I don't remember and I don't know whether I wrote it in or it was in the memoir or Marielle wrote it in. Okay. I wrote it in, it was just, yeah. It's yeah. just really beautifully done because, you know, it's again, even if you've never lived in New York, you have this sense of New York is bitterly cold and there's that great shot of her like being cold. But look, this brings us, we have to, we've run over and thank you so much for your generosity with your time, but we're going to look at the very last scene that we can that we have time for which you know is also tied together with the theme of fancy cloak rooms or coat checks at parties right so this is the introduction of jack yeah so again it's just like an absolutely delightful scene like it's really hard to stop it um but i i haven't read the 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 memoir um but again like i'm always looking at like underneath plot Mm -hmm. Where is the heart of the film? So just like, you know, underneath the love story and enough said, there's this, you know, whole theme of like loneliness and the second part of your life. And, you know, are you braver or are you better or are you bitter by the time you've got like, you know, 40 something years under your belt, you know. But in this, it seemed to me, and it seemed so beautiful that um, it's about this platonic love really between the two of them so was that a choice that you made that you brought to it um I guess so um I know that um a lot of it was gleaned from the memoir um but I don't think they were as close um as I made them in the story um you know she really needed to have someone to talk to to work off of to pal around with you know so I think his part got bigger um yeah they're they're it's interesting to see it now and see how the relationship plays out that you can sort of see it's all set up um him wanting her approval him being kind of sketchier than um yet wanting um to make her as bad as him you know and then they become partners in crime it's interesting um you know it's a lovely directed scene it really is but the writing is such that like it's twist, it turns in this very unexpected way because mm-hmm. he's like, what do I remember? What do I remember? And he, you know, is, you know, clearly a blackout drunk who, uh, you know, is going, well, let's not, you know, let's, let's move past that because he knows whatever it is like, or no, he remembers what it is. Cause he says, some people stop talking to me after that. Right. Yeah. So he doesn't want her to remember, but right. when the memory comes back, she's so delighted by it do you know and that's like such an unexpected turn and again well, that's, that's how they become friends it's like is that gonna work for you and it does work for her you know yeah it's not that she likes him in spite of it she likes him because of it yeah 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 but like one of the things that I was taught is we should always see the moment when two people fall in love you know mm-hmm. we don't see enough to me platonic love Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but and if I remember correctly both those characters are gay right yeah so there's never a suggestion that the love could be anything but platonic but my memory of it is that when he is letting her down she's away on a trip I was just like oh my heart was in my mouth because I was so invested in that well our friends break our hearts just as much as you know loved ones Maybe as much. I, I don't know. Maybe not as much, but yeah. No, it's heartbreaking when you love somebody. It doesn't matter whether it's platonic or not. Yeah. And that and they're all they have, you know, each other. Um, they don't have anybody else, you know. Yeah, they're two lost souls, like, you know, but it's still like it's a very imperfect love, but it's a real love. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so I just think it's like a master class of a of a of a scene of introduction of of a secondary character that as you say everything's foreshadowed the sketchiness you know his personality comes across I mean again the casting is just perfect but I don't think anybody could have mucked it up when it's so well written you know I mean you know Richard D. Grant is bringing so much more to it because he's bringing himself you know but right 
great actors, man. They yeah. make everything look good. Oh, but, but <laughs> they make it look better. better. I've just had my teeth bleached. What do you think? And her, why would you do that? Her teeth are a dead giveaway. I just love that all of that so he's so vivid um I think that's probably the thing like if other people are going to learn from you know deconstructing your work I think it's like the specificity is the thing that you know you could look at um most because it yeah to me it's just like I fall under the spell you know like because it all seems so real you know it's just so gorgeous can um, you just come and stay next to me when I'm writing something new <laughs> I think and go, look how great you are. <laughs> yeah, and I want to give up, and I'm on page 60, and I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do? Yeah. Well, do you, you know what, Mary Kate? <laughs> Anytime you want. But come here, the, the, the trick that a professor told me was write your the best review you could possibly get before you start writing your script. And really? Then get to page 60, so you just go, right, Nicole Hollison has just put the world on fire with her new movie, da, 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 whatever it would be. Especially in the middle. Yeah. yeah yeah just when you think it might flag it gets even better right. <laughs> yeah so like, well if this guy used to say to me sooner or later you will think this is derivative this is useless I don't know why I'm writing this and all the fire will be gone and that's when you go and you get to review and you remind yourself why at the beginning you thought it was you know your gift to the world right. but um you know yeah. your have meant so much to me and it's such a delight I do hope you'll be able to come and be with us in Galway in person but thanks again for how generous you've been with your time today my I hope pleasure nice with I'm us. so happy to talk to you oh you too thank you I'm so much I'm a big fan of yours so oh that's the word I'd love to see you tell stories in person I would love it oh one day yes Stella. next time I'm in Los Angeles I'll let you know Please okay. do. Take care, Nicole. Lovely. Thank you for so much. You too. Bye. Bye.